So welcome everybody. Today is uh, March 24th, 2023. Uh, welcome um, Paolo Cassano. This is the MGH Brain PBM Rounds. Uh, it is uh, uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Katrin Hamilton uh, at WellRed and uh, Dr. Uh, John Mitrofanis at the University of Grenoble Les Alpes, uh, who are going to be talking about uh, Parkinson and both the expected and unexpected findings uh, with the photobiomodulation. Uh, welcome, Catherine and John. Uh, please uh, take it away. Okay. Do do do. Um, I, I must share screen at some point. Please do. Please, yeah. Please. Uh, do you see everything? <clears throat> we yeah, do. I see. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. So uh, what we thought we'd do is, uh, firstly, it's a pleasure to, to be here, even though it's, uh, it's what, five past three in the morning, <laughs> and as two senior citizens here in, in Tasmania, it's, uh, yeah, it's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so what we thought we'd do, and thank you so much for the invitation, Paolo and David. Um, what we thought we'd do is uh, I could give a, a, a little bit of an introduction um, on the preclinical work, uh, and then Catherine will take over for the bulk of the talk um, for her clinical observations. Um, and what I'll talk about is uh, um, mainly a little bit of a history, um, and most of it's been published, and most of you may be familiar with um, what I'll talk about. Um, so my interest in Parkinson disease uh, stretches back uh, nearly 20 years um, um, with a collaboration with uh, Monsieur Benabid, who is uh, pictured there looking quite debonair. Um, and most of you may know him as the father of the current surgical treatment for Parkinson's disease, and that's deep brain stimulation. And we, we worked together on deep brain stimulation back back in those days, and we were looking at issues of neuroprotection um, in a preclinical um, animal model. And um, after I finished that um, sabbatical in 2003, um, I maintained an interest in neuroprotection. Uh, um, and I came across photo this concept of photobiomodulation after having a cup of coffee with this man. Um, <laughs> Jonathan Stone, um, we were friends, long-term um, collaborators, and he was telling me huh? he was telling me that um, he was uh, working on the retina, and he um, he was telling me that he he has come across this new neuroprotective agent um, which saves photoreceptors from from death, and I, I said to him, "What what what is that?" And he said, um, "Red light," and I thought he was kidding, um, but he he <laughs> clearly wasn't. And uh, I said to him, how does it work? And he said, it mainly works on stimulating the mitochondria to work better. And at that point, I said, oh, that's interesting because Parkinson's disease is thought to be mainly a mitochondrial, uh, to, to, to arise from mitochondrial dysfunction. And we put two and two together and we thought, okay, well, why don't we uh, see if one helps the other one? So we did some work on, on a rodent model of Parkinson's disease. And we found that, that those rodents had more cells than the ones, the ones that were treated had more cells than the ones that weren't treated. So I rang my old friend, um, uh, Monsieur Benabid, and I, and I told him this, and he really drove the translation of this work to, to the humans. Now, at this point, I just want to touch on the issue of, of, of light penetration, um, because the pathology of, the bulk of the pathology in Parkinson's disease is very, very deep in in the brain and if you apply the light transcranially it probably won't reach the main zone of pathology in the substantia nigra pars compactor um, we and others have measured the penetration of light through uh, body tissues and it probably goes to about 20 millimeters um, probably probably not much more than that um, certainly not the 80 or 100 uh, millimeters I mean, it's got to get through um, hair well some of us have hair um, not all of us, um, skin, bone, uh, can it, don't laugh, Puyalo, Paolo, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, connective tissue, and of course, the bulk of that brain um, is probably not going to reach there. 
So Ben said we have to develop an intracranial device, and that's what that's what we we did uh, for the last 10, uh, 12 years. And at present, it's it's with um, at the clinical stage, three patients have been implanted, and that's work led by uh, Stefan uh, Chabadres. In um, he's the neurosurgeon in charge of the project, and of course Cecile Moreau is also involved in 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 that uh, as as well. Um, now, at, at this point, I, I just want to touch on an issue which has always baffled me throughout throughout this work is why the hell would neurons uh, located so deep in the brain uh, have light sensitive receptors? Uh, that was always something that that bothered me, and it was difficult to explain uh, to others. And and the idea has been um, uh, floated around recently, which kind of makes sense to me. Um, and I've talked about it with with Anne Liebert and um, and Paolo as, uh, as well, and uh, Jamie Ho in um, Grenoble is, is currently working on this. The reason why they have light receptors is because they themselves use light to communicate with each other and possibly to repair each other. And that all we're doing as people who use photobiomodulation is to tap into that network, into that light communication network between neurons. And that is the, uh, the biophoton um, um, system of communication. Um, and I hope that's something that uh, we could talk about um, in, in, future, in future meetings. But I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up. Um, so what we did, uh, looking at some uh, preclinical uh, testing of to see if, if this intracranial device was uh, effective. We, we looked at animal models, and at this point I'll say there's no perfect animal models for Parkinson's disease or for any disease for, for that matter. So the more of the different types of animal models you use, then the better you have of an idea of what's going on in, in the human. And at this point, some 15 years after we started, um, in every animal model that you could think of for the disease, uh, in rodents, even in flies, people have, have used it in flies, um, whether it be toxin-induced or transgenic, it's always been shown to be uh, beneficial. We also had the uh, rare opportunity of using uh, the monkey model, uh, which is the gold standard, really, of, of animal model before we go to preclinical testing. Um, so in every of the, one of those models, it's been, it's been effective. Now, what I'll just touch on briefly before I hand you over to, um, to Catherine um, is, is just some of the, uh, the results that we, we found in our animal models. I'll focus on the monkeys because all our <laughs> earlier rodent um, uh, explorations, uh, the monkey basically showed the, the same patterns. I'll talk about behavior and I'll talk about the neuroprotection of, of photobiomodulation um, in this model, because really neuroprotection is the holy grail. Um, it's, it's the, uh, at present, no current treatment for the disease stops the progression of the disease. All the, all the treatments are, are largely symptomatic. So um, really it's the holy grail for, for neuroscience. So looking at behavior, um, uh, Firstly, I'll show you an open field test. And this is like uh, these images here, um, are like you're looking at the cage front on. Um, so this is the top of the cage and this is the bottom of the cage. And um, the camera was in front of the, the cage and that was linked to a computer. And it monitored the, the movement of the animal over a 20 minute period. And you can see here for the control um, over that 20 minute period, uh, the animal was very, very active. It was going up and down the cage, up, down the cage. The Parkinsonian animal, which was treated with the toxin MPTP, which is a well-known uh, toxin for the disease, uh, didn't move at all. It was very akinetic um, and very Parkinsonian. But look at the light-treated animal. Um, this one was moving around the cage, not quite as much as the control, but certainly much more than the, um, the, the one that wasn't treated uh, with light. Now, um, this model is, um, is not called the gold standard of animal models for nothing. Um, these animals do develop quite Parkinsonian um, signs. So they become akinetic, they, they, they're, they're rigid. Um, some of them develop uh, tremor. Um, so we were able to score them clinically in the same way we uh, score um, human patients. And the higher the score, then the, the, the greater the, the impairment, motor impairment. 
And you could see here that the, the, the controls had a clinical score of, of, of zero. That makes sense. They weren't uh, Parkinsonian at all. We see the Parkinsonian animals had uh, quite a high, a high clinical score, but all the light treated animals had much, much lower uh, mean clinical scores. Um, some of them had hardly um, had, had clinical scores of one or, or two, and we did 11 of these um, light treated animals. So we have an improvement in behavior and a big reduction in clinical scoring. And now for the Holy Grail. Um, is it neuroprotective? Uh, we counted the number of cells in the substantia nigra pass compactor. We also looked at the termination patterns in the striatum. And as most of you may know, the striatum is where the main dopaminerg dopaminergic synapse is in the brain. It's where the bulk of the communication happens and the dopaminergic uh, neurotransmission happens. And it's where all the most of the drugs work. So the striatum is really the, the central hub of, 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 of dopaminergic transmission. And you can see here that um, there were less cells and terminals in the Parkinsonian animals. That's good. That suggests that indicates that our um, uh, our <coughs> model was effective. Uh, but you see, in both terms of cell number and terminal density, there were always more cells and terminations in the light -treat treated animals compared to the uh, Parkinsonian animals. Not quite as much as the controls, but certainly much more than the Parkinsonian animals. Um, so it's, it appears to be neuroprotective in, in animal models. But the big question um, is, is, will this be uh, effective in, in, uh, in humans? Now, the intracranial device is really for the patients of tomorrow. There's uh, three patients which have been operated at the moment, and early indications are that things are going uh, well, but the real results will come over the next year. Um, so for the patients of today, really, the extracranial device is, is the, the, only, the only option. But as I indicated to you before, there's the, the, the issue of penetration. Um, the light will not get to the main zone of pathology in the substantia nigra so deep um, in the brain. Um, so will this work? Um, well, we think it will work um, or can be effective in, in two ways. Um, firstly, even though the light doesn't reach the main zone of pathology in the substantia nigra, it could certainly reach um, superficial areas of the brain in, in the cortex. And, uh, and we and uh, others, certainly Paolo, has, has, has shown that it can change uh, brain activity. Um, so in this case, it could reach, say, motor areas of the cortex or other areas of the cortex and influence the descending pathways and, and improve movement or improve uh, cognition. Um, so it can certainly influence healthy neurons, but it can be neuroprotective. It could be neuroprotective in that um, even though it doesn't reach the main zone of pathology directly, it can reach the blood vessels and the lymphatics, of which there are plenty uh, in the scalp. And it may influence uh, something in the circulation, like immune cells, stem cells, or the free-floating mitochondria, which uh, seem to be abundant or seem to be present in, in the, the vasculature stimulate them, and then they will swarm to the area of distress deep in the brain and help those cells survive. Now, we know that this indirect um, form of, 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 of uh, benefit is effective because we have evidence of it in um, several animal models of, of disease um, where we stimulate um, one area of the body and we get benefits in another area of the body. And this is the so-called um, abscopal effect. So using these two basic mechanisms, it, um, the transcranial approach could still be effective, what we thought could still be effective um, in a Parkinson patients. And at this point, I'll pass you over to the lovely Catherine, who will tell you about, about her wonderful findings in, in, in her patients. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's almost a pleasure to be here at three something or other in the morning. <laughs> so, oh, how do I press this? I'll do it. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just talking about what hap um, observations I've made um, over the years um, being involved in this. And I just want to tell you the story first about how it all happened. Can yeah. I press the button? Just, just click your fingers like that. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2015, I, I, I was looking for something to treat my arthritic knee that wasn't um, 
uh, a knee replacement and I came across photobiomodulation and, and uh, read that, um, uh, that it had the potential to uh, replace cartilage cells, but also replace brain cells. Now, being a retired doctor, of course, I knew everything and I knew this was complete rubbish um, until I was shamed when I started looking um, closely in the literature and realised that there was a really big body of excellent work. And I came across the work of the, uh, the John um, had done at the Mitrofanos lab at the University of Sydney and with his colleagues and the, and the University of Grenoble Alps. And I was really impressed and excited by it. And I'm a, I'm a maker. I tend to kind of make things. So I thought, let's have a play with this. And I have a friend who, um, who has um, Parkinson's and I asked him whether he's interested in having a go at something odd. And he was, bless him. So where do I press? Okay. So it started out um, with a a lampshade from the charity shop, the top left there. And I bought some lead strips, um, 670 nanometers, which is a wavelength that John's team had used. And then kind of concocted something in the middle and you can see the lead strips on the bottom left. On the top right, you can see Max wearing it and, um, and it looks pretty good, doesn't it? And then, then that moved to a, a bucket light hat and you can see him wearing his bucket light hat. Very fetching, you can see it's very fetching. Um, so Max used it for a few months and then he, he was due to see his neurologist, I'm oh, sorry, his geriatrician, um, Frank Nicholson, who's based here in Tasmania. And Frank is a geriatrician, but he has a real interest in Parkinson's. <clears throat> and he, he told me later that he was preparing to tell um, Max that, uh, he would, that Max needed to increase medication. And he wasn't looking forward to that conversation because Max could be yeah, he was. He was. Uh, he had views of his own. Um, huh? Just press the screen. Oh, thank you. Okay. So he he uh, saw Max and was very surprised at the improvements. He noticed there were motor improvements that were very obvious um, in terms of his his tremor and his gait and his facial animation. Um, and so Frank said, okay, I don't think, I don't need to increase your medication. Uh, so Frank and I had a conversation afterwards and he asked whether I'd make some more bucket hats for other patients of his. Um, and so I'll just show you that one. Okay. So that, that's kind of another bucket light hat here. Then we thought we'd try um, lining the insides of, of, a, of a hair drying outfit, you know, from the old fashioned um, a hair salon thing that didn't work that's Jeff there wearing that one and then we've kind of found this idea called the we call the Cossack what we made with wire mesh so you can see we've been through quite a few iterations of, of DIY but they helped um, they all definitely helped and at the end of 2016 uh, John came down and uh, met a lot of the people who who we were working with and uh, gave us a presentation and we all had a nice lunch it was really great um it was in this room, wasn't it? Yeah, it was here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but not everyone wanted to wear a bucket. So I have one chap who, who uh, for whom I had to, you know, cover it with fabric um, because he didn't want to be seen when he was caravanning around Australia wearing a bucket on his head. But if I put some fabric on, it was okay. Yeah. So what we were looking for um, then it was just totally focused on motor motor science um we you know every time i saw max and, and jeff and the other people involved i'd be peering at their at their hands and or, you know whatever part of them had a tremor i'd be peering at it closely to see what was going on i mean watching their gait and and um and 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 also looking at their face and certainly we noticed that um there are improvements in in a number of motor things which is good but we're looking at the safety of the device um it's a 12 volt dc um, even though it's DIY, it was it was safe. Um, whether people um, were prepared to use it regularly, um, I wanted them to use it twice daily, and that's a big ask. And so that was another thing I was looking for, you know, compliance. Um, whether there are any adverse side effects, and of course, changes in motor signs. So what we found was that it was safe. No one electrocuted themselves. It would be difficult anyway with a 12 volt DC device. There were improvements in motor sign. There was high compliance that people found it easy to use and they, they um, quite look forward to using it. 
um, which was interesting. Obviously, just the, the having it on their head was was something was nice about it, which made them keep using it and keeping incorporating it in their daily routine. Um, there were no adverse side effects. So we had one, the only possible side effect is a bit more hair growth. One chappy um, who had very white um, sideburns here started to get um, brown, more the old brown colour, and he was pretty chuffed and a bit more sprouting on, on bald heads. Really? Yeah. <laughs> One bloke got so much, you know, sort of fluff on his head, I threatened to buy him a comb. <laughs> um, but what we started to find and what we did not expect and what we were totally not looking for was improvement in non-motor symptoms. And, and I've become come quite obsessed with this um, over time. So we moved from um, the DIY light hats to the coronet. Um, and I'll just show you here a friend on the left, Neil, wearing one. And uh, Monsieur Benabid um, wearing a coronet in France. So I've kept in touch and I do keep in touch with a lot of people who wear either the homemade devices or the coronets. And, um, and before COVID, uh, I was with people who lived in, in Tasmania. I was able to go and visit them, set them up, and then go check on them and, and scrounge cups of tea from them and, and just see how they were going over, over time. Um, that, of course, got a bit difficult once COVID came, but I still keep in touch with them pretty closely. So what we found was improvement in motor signs. Tremor, the external, internal tremor improved. Um, and the internal tremor was, is, is pretty interesting. Gait improved speech, articulation of phonation. Some, with some people, even people with ex, uh, who, who were very... Um, well progressed with their Parkinson's um, you could see improvements in their speech and articulation just during the first session of wearing the, the lights um, which was can be quite remarkable fine finger movements improved which is which is really important in being able to do up your shirts and so on uh, freezing of gait improved which made a difference to a number of people for their just feeling confident about walking to the shops Swallowing, um, facial animation, writing, and the thing I'm really interested in, non-motor symptoms, a whole bunch of them. So the first of them was a sense of smell. And Max noticed it. Um, he, uh, he could smell the roast, roast chicken that his wife was cooking, um, which he hadn't been able to smell for ages. Um, and he was a bit surprised by that, as was Frank, the geriatrician, and, and I. Um, but this has been quite consistent. We've, we've had a Con, you know, consistent reports of improvement in the sense of smell, which is um, kind of gold standard when it comes to Parkinson's because once you lose olfaction, then you've lost it forever. Um, and, of course, 90% of people with Parkinson's lose it. So that's, that's pretty, pretty telling that something useful is happening. Fatigue was another thing that improved. Now, of course, in the clinical consulting room, fatigue is the elephant in, in that room. Because you know the patients will complain a bit of being tired. What can you do? What can you do to help me stop being so tired, doctor? And and of course we can't do anything. Um, and the fact that if fatigue improved and, and people got more energetic was 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 great and surprising. Sleep quality and dream enactment. And sometimes that happened after one night, uh, the, the the night after starting to use lights, um, and that made a huge difference, obviously, because of their energy levels, because they're getting a decent sleep. It also made a big difference to um, their partners because they weren't being thumped during the dream enactment process. The one that I'm particularly fascinated by is, is, is apathy. Um, and it's, 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 it's present in um, over a third of people with, with Parkinson's. And it's a harbinger of, of bad things. It's, it, it seems to an indicate that um, there's going to be a faster progression of the disease and a faster loss of motor function and cognitive function. And apathy improved, um, even in people who didn't know they had apathy. Some, some people did said that I've lost my, you know, they lost my interest in doing things. And that's really important to me. Other people had not realized they'd lost it and then regained their interest in it and realized in retrospect that yes, they had apathy. Um, so it was quite an important um, important one. 
Aaron, I'm sorry, three o'clock in the morning, I'm not doing well. <laughs> I might come back to that. Um, cognitive things like attention and memory, uh, uh, memory and judgment and decision making improved. It was, it was um, people were much less um, befuddled and they able to make decisions and which uh, made a big difference. The th another one that fascinates me is auditory and visual processing. Um, and notice sometimes, again, in the first time people were using their light device, um, is that they the auditory processing would improve. They'd uh, take much less time to understand what someone was saying with them, and their conversation um, quality would change. There was a, a, a couple I was watching, and he was well down the Parkinson's path, um, and he was talking to his wife, and before they started he started the lights the she would say something and then would have to repeat it because he didn't hear and his response was quite slow and monosyllabic um and then while the lights were on um he his speech changed his phonation improved his articulation improved but his ability the speed in which the they were interacting in their conversations increased it was more kind of normal instead of the big gaps while he was contemplating and what she said, and then formulating a response, it became much faster, um, which was quite quite astonishing to see. And I guess that's one of the reasons why social interactions improve in people who who use lights, is because the auditory processing is improving. Same with visual processing. People who got who'd stopped reading books have, were able to um, start start reading again because they could remember. Um, what the one page and then be able to turn the page having remembered what happened before um, which was which is lovely for them um, anxiety improved I don't need to tell you guys about all all that um, and um, depression and mood pain improved constipation anhedonia the the one lady described it as the the loss of the capacity for joy um, and she hadn't realized she'd lost it until one day after she'd been using, she started off with bucket lights, um, she realised that she, ha she had this moment of exhilaration and, and when she was walking on a windswept cliff overlooking a beautiful beach and just one of those magical days. And she felt just alive and exhilarated and then realised she hadn't felt like that for at least 10 years. And then she, she, she was angry that she had lost the capacity for joy and even more angry that she hadn't realized it had gone. Um, so I, I tell this story to people when I go and set up coronets for them. Um, and and then at the end of it, and I say, now tell me about your capacity for joy. <laughs> it's a bit of a hard question to ask, but it's an interesting one because then they think about it. Things like balance improves, uh, social engagement, and the sense of self. This is another one that it's fascinated me too is that people would say I feel like me again you know I feel like I feel like I've got myself back again um and one lady who was 20 years down the Parkinson's um progression and 24 hour care and pretty well chair bound um told me that that she'd uh, she she said I've got my personality back and when the way she told me was kind of odd so I asked her is this a good thing and she thought about it for a while and said, mostly. And the reason for, for her saying mostly, she said she was more aware of things to worry about. Um, so I asked, does that, you know, would you rather not wear the, the light hat? And would you rather not be worrying about? Oh no. She wanted to, she wanted to know. She was quite a matriarch in that family. So it was, it was, um, it was quite lovely. Okay. So Non-motor symptoms really matter. If you, there are lots of studies that show if you talk to people about what are the symptoms that really cause them the most distress and that they wish could be magically taken away. Most of them are non-motor symptoms like the fatigue, problem sleeping, cognitive function, the things that I've listed there. And when you ask the carers, it's a pretty well the same things because it's really difficult living with someone who's constantly tired, who's sleeping badly and thumping you in bed at night, who's cognitively impaired and um, he's anxious, depressed and apathetic. It is not a happy household 
living with someone like that, they're the things that really improve. And the carers often get more pleasure out of the improvements in the um in the, in the symptoms of their of their partners than the partner actually does. So there's a whole lot of things we've noticed. Um, and you can see with those with the asterisks of are, are those um, that there are either no treatment available or limited treatment. Um, so if there's no treatment available for fatigue, nor for apathy. And the, the, the treatments available to improve sleep are problematic, as are those for cognitive function. Um, um, there's no treatment for the capacity for joy. And there's no treatment for feeling like my old self again. What we notice too is that improving these non-motor um, symptoms reduces the obstacles to exercise, which is really a really vital thing for people with Parkinson's to do. Um, and when they have improved cognitive function, um, improved motivation, improved um, energy levels, then they're much more likely to take on a, an appropriate um, exercise program, which is itself will make a difference to, to um, their progress. And there's no treatment for being more socially engaged um, with family and friends, which is a big thing that we see. So I've noticed some other odd things I thought I'd list here. Now, these are my observations. They may or may not be correct. This is what I've, I've noticed of watching lots of people over the last years and keeping contact with lots of people. Um, there, is a, there does seem to be a gender difference that women do seem to respond better than men in general. Um, there's a does seem to be a difference in response depending on the level of insight that, that people um, have into their symptoms. Um, and the classic is, is, you know, the older bloke um, uh, who, who has very little insight into what's happening, whether he's losing function or, or if he wears lights, uh, gaining function again. Um, and often the, the carer and other family members notice things that have improved. People with early onset Parkinson's, this is probably a bit of a broad statement, but they seem to respond very well to, to transcranial light and I think possibly better than those with late onset. But it's a very useful thing to consider in people with early onset Parkinson's, given the number of years that they're, they're going to be living with a rotten thing. So I've noticed that non-motor improvements tend to be maintained. The, the motor improvements can be maintained in some people, but in others tend to just slowly decrease. Um, um, I've been watching people now since 2016, and the this is a this is a statement I know I'll get some criticism for, but it really does look like disease progression is slowed. Um, I get comments from individuals saying, "I think it has," you know, I really feel it has because I haven't needed to have any extra medication in this time since I've used lights, and patients are increasingly reporting that their clinician is saying, wow, you're, you're doing well. Um, I expected you not to be doing as well as this at this stage. Um, we've noticed that if, if people stop um, the daily lights, then they lose the improvements and that loss is noticeable in a few days. Um, improvements resume when, when people um, uh, resume lights, but, but it can take a few weeks. Um, one chappy, Al told me that, that he, he called it the three day rule. If he doesn't use a coronet or his light device for one day, then it takes a good three days for him to get back. What he, and in, if he doesn't use it, he becomes apathetic, flat um, uh, and tired and, and just grumpy. And um, his wife says to him, have you used your lights today? And he was like, oh no. You know? So it's pretty obvious that, that things go wrong, but it takes a few days for him to get back to normal. If, um, some people leave their light devices at home when they go for a two week holiday and come home feeling miserable. Um, and you know, I'll get an email from them, should I have taken on my holiday? Yes, you should have. You know, It really is a, a daily thing that you, you need to use to be effective. There are something you, you all know that there's different people have different rates of responses. Um, 
and uh, some respond much more quickly than others. Some some respond immediately to sticking lights on their head. Some take it takes a few weeks before something becomes noticeable, and responses are often not noticed by the person um, with Parkinson's. It's their carer or a family member who comes in weekly or monthly who notices a difference in how well they're getting in at and out of a car or the, the fact that they're more involved in a conversation um, and that uh, they're just, just happier, yeah. Um, and yes, long-term use is essential for maximum benefit. It's I kind of describe it as, as really needing to clean your teeth every day if you want to keep your good, good um, oral hygiene, if you want to keep your brain working well and use your, um, use your lights every day. So the implications, um, the fact that we have a, a safe um, and easy to use treatment modality that will treat uh, and improve otherwise untreatable non-motor symptoms is pretty stunning, especially things like apathy, because um, uh, it makes such a difference to people's lives. And it, because the big question is, if you if you improve apathy in people, does that mean that they 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 the, the, the progression, the faster progression slows down, um, the, the faster progression associated with apathy? Um, so that'd be really interesting to test in itself. Improving non-motor symptoms enhances the quality of life for, for both the patients and the carers, and it certainly has the potential to reduce healthcare costs. So that's a big. Um, motivating factor, I think, um, that last one. Um, a particular opportunity for people with um, early onset Parkinson's disease. And, and clearly my statement that I think that it is slowing down disease progression um, needs to be tested. So people are voting with their heads, even though there's not a huge amount um, in terms of clinical trials on Parkinson's and, um, and photobiomodulation there's sufficient interest in it that people will, will have a go at themselves. So I set up the Red Lights on the Brain blog in 2017, and it's got the instructions to make your own like Cossack, um, which you can see Michael down the bottom there wearing. He's a retired engineer who came up with this idea. Um, and it's, it's great fun. People all over the world are making these things and sticking them on their head. And yes, it's not as good as other light devices available commercially, but it still makes a difference. Um, and you can make your own if you uh, care to look at the instructions on the blog. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Thank you. What a wonderful story, <clears throat> both of you. I mean, it's uh, it's so rich. Uh, I have to say that um, I really loved the um, the display of psychopathology and the dissection. Um, that you made about the different effects. Um, you know, I, I, I want to open this to, uh, to the floor for, for any questions. Uh, let, me, let me just ask a few. Um, I, I was curious about uh, um, what do you make about uh, the fact that women seem to respond better? Is that a matter of uh, size of the head or, or the, are they using the light earlier in the course of the illness? Um, I don't know if you no, have any thoughts. No, it's not. I've, we've got, I've worked with women, at, you know, young onset and very, very kind of old who start the lights. It's it's it just, and, and I'm sorry if it sounds sexist, but it, I've just noticed that women do tend to have more insight into their disease. And so um, it's that combination of insight and being female. Yeah, I might be wrong, but that's what it looks like. So, so it's always, I know, they use it just the same as the blokes. Okay, so if you, thank you. If you mind, um, don't mind to stop sharing and then uh, uh, we can see if there are any other questions and people feel free to, to jump in uh, if you have any comments or questions. Well, I'll start then, Paolo, hi. Hey, James. Um, it's there's, there's a lot of people do work and I've been involved in work at MGH um, uh, for those of you from MGH at uh, in Charlestown at the pediatric place where you've moved to Paolo. Um, that's right. And um, 
uh, I mean, we've always worked to get light to the target and a lot of photobiomodulation work, most photobiomodulation work, not just the brain everywhere. Um, uh, it works on the belief that uh, reaching, getting light to the target is, uh, well, it's, it's as if it's the only way to go. And we do know there's some indirect mechanisms. Uh, we know that we can treat um, proximal to an injury in the lymphatic system uh, and that you have effects on reducing inflammation and edema. You know, we have, you can do the same in analgesia as well, um, blood flow, of course. Uh, and uh, the, those people working uh, hard to get enough light to the target in the brain, um, obviously seems to start with the same premise. You've got to get light to the target. And clearly here you are, um, and many have shown uh, these indirect mechanisms at work. Uh, this is a long way down. You've got to get light to the substantia nigra. Um, so um, uh, I don't think I heard you mention anything like hemodynamic effects, but many people have actually looked at this and shown that what looks to me like relatively low density light, uh, and I'm, by low density, I mean many light emitting studies, less than 50 milliwatts per centimeter squared, are barely getting any light, in my view, to cortical neurons. And yet here you are, there is published work. I wonder, I mean, I'm really intrigued to see if or how much better the, I'm really giving a sermon, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get to a question. Do you agree um, that, um, or do you, where, where are you at now, John, with uh, uh, the, in your, how much confidence you have in that actually using fiber optics to get light to the target is going to change anything? Whereas your, have you got any any reasons for hope that this is going to be a more successful treatment, or are you are you quietly thinking to yourself, do you know what this transcranial thing is low risk and seems to work well, and maybe this isn't going to be necessary? Pick it up from there, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is a multiple choice. Uh, do I get a do I get yes. a <laughs> look? I I I just take the the very. Uh, simple view that 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 um, if you want to give a cell a neuron the best chance of survival if it's in distress, um, then get the light on it directly. So I think that the intracranial device, with the light reaching those uh, cells uh, with pathology directly, um, will give them the uh, the best help, the most benefit. Um, so uh, we're, we're very hopeful that the intracranial device will be <coughs> neuroprotective first to save the cells which are in distress, get them making more dopamine. The transcranial device um, will give that symptomatic treatment by stimulating cortical areas. And uh, like there's many distinguished people on, on, on this, this broadcast that, that um, have, have shown quite clearly that it can change cortical activity. Um, um, but it could also be neuroprotective, as you said, through this indirect system, through the, the, the vasculature. Um, so in answer to your question, I think if I was early onset, I would, I would uh, think seriously about having the intracranial device to give my cells the best chance of survival. But I would also use the transcranial device to improve that these non-motor symptoms, which uh, Catherine has uh, has 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 uh, seen um, um, improved in her in her patients, so I would use a combination of, of of both, ideally, ideally, to get the benefit, the maximum benefits of not only neuroprotection but also the symptomatic ones. Thanks. But you know, most most patients, as uh, Catherine will testify, that that they're not too keen to have um, a hole drilled in, <laughs> in, into their head, so they're they're more likely to 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 try the the non invasive transcranial way. It is easier. Yeah. Yeah. As an advocate for both the physiological and the electrophysiological intervention strategy. I'm just wondering whether you think that the neural network renormalization that might come from 
some form of, of neurofeedback type intervention might support the uh, removing the the draining away of the benefit. Oh, Andy, um, that's yours. What what do what uh, uh, what do you mean by normalizing? Um, oh, renormalizing the network. Yeah. I mean, neural networks electrically have been disrupted by the pathology of the tissue level pathology. Yeah. If you can then yeah. use an intervention to renormalize the network activity, yeah. both you know the structural and the effective networks, might that not help with helping the improvement stick? Yes, abs absolutely. And a, a lot of the improvements that Catherine would has has seen are probably through that through that renormalization. Um, but whether it's neuroprotective, whether it's actually stopping these cells which are dying, are dysfunctional, transcranially, well, we, we, we don't know. We know from animal models that, it, it, that it's, it, it's effective, not quite as effective as the direct, mm. but it's still there. I don't know, Marnie, is that you, Marnie, there? Maybe you'd like to comment uh, a little bit more on, on the default mode network or... In, in, in these patients? Well, I'd be glad to comment on it. I can't comment on Parkinson's disease. We have no experience. Uh, it's with our traumatic brain injury and actually with our football players who have, have probably developing um, possible CTE. And we do see these increases mostly in the salience network, not in the default mode network, although that's what we treated. <laughs> um, at least with their home treatment devices using the V-Late NeuroGamma. But when we do our main studies with the football players, for example, this is American style, you know, full collision tackle football, uh, a lot of uh, repetitive head impacts. Uh, they have, um, in the beginning, very poor connectivity in the salience network. And then you can treat the whole head and it goes way up, the functional connectivity in the salience network. We do not see it in default mode network, although that's what we treat it. But salience network drives the default mode network. And I think it's apply, applying the LED, we just use LEDs, um, you know, at the um, top of the forehead, at the hairline. Um, and so we're probably delivering, first of all, um, LA, you know, near infrared light to the mesial prefrontal cortex. But immediately behind that is the anterior, sing uh, is the anterior cingulate, which is very important in the salience network. So we seem to have indirectly really, really improved the salience network functional connectivity. And we didn't see much in the default mode network. And Linda Chow out in San Francisco found the same thing when she was working with a professional ice hockey player, you know, six concussions in five and a half years. And she only used the V-Lite uh, NeuroGamma and uh, she found the changes were in the salience network, uh, not the default mode network, but at least we saw consistent changes. So does that help you? Okay. Well, it certainly can, it certainly tracks along with our, what we found when we did the people who had both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in our study and the app with the, the change in apathy was marked. And this was a two month trial where they were using them units six minutes twice a day for two months and their apathy and their motor skills and their fine motor skills and their brain their network activity their neural network activity significantly improved and i think kristen williams is going to be talking about that in a couple of months using some of our data when you say neural network activity was that with function was that with resting state functional connectivity mri that was resting. It was resting state with a quantitative EEG. Oh, it's QEEG. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. So on, on da with daily treatment, uh, um, have you seen this being too much in any of your uh, patients, so whether it's uh, um, you know, your experience, Catherine, or your experience, Marvin? And uh, There are people who are high, highly sensitive, and that's why we always work with a titration dosing schedule to make sure that people don't over, overstimulate it. 
So I guess uh, your answer is like uh, you reduce the daily dose, but you keep the the frequency. Yeah. And if we had uh, if we had the quantitative, if we had the neurofeedback on board simultaneously, I don't know how necessary that would be, and that's where we want to end up figuring that out in the near term. And I guess uh, the question also, um, I'm curious about highly sensitive. What, what happens to those people who are highly sensitive if you, if you kind of go a little overboard? Yeah, uh, dizzy, sleepy, headache, irritable, anxious, and congested. Those are the main responses. Congested so meaning like the sense of fogginess uh, in, in, yeah. It's the, my phrase is your head feels like a grapefruit. And Catherine, any comment on that? No, uh, there are some people who are exquisitely sensitive to it. And so I suggest that they do exactly um, as, as described there, that they start with just a couple of minutes um, once a day and then very slowly build it up um, and then start uh, on twice a day against yeah. one, one in the morning with a full dose and in the evening or vice versa mm -hmm. with, with, with the lesser dose building up. Um, and sometimes they prefer to, instead of using the full 24 minutes, they might use 18 and, and be happy with that. So it's, it's an individual thing. Most people, though, just fine with, with just going straight into the, um, into the coronet. But yes, there are those who are extra sensitive. Yeah, I've had some people who've used the coronet who we had to dial them back and start them back on about three minutes. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, Anne, do you want to pipe in? Um, yes, we, we found also probably two out of 40 in um, our three trials that we've run so far um, have um, ultra sensitivity, often with a history of migraine or channelopathy. Um, and I would absolutely agree with Paolo about um, the side effects, or we call them reactions, um, and you do have to downtrack titrate the dose but we also found dystonia and other dysautonomia um, symptoms as well especially with the very sensitive Parkinsonian um, patients that have um, dysautonomia anyway um, so as, as long as we titrate the dose down explain them uh, very carefully um, and then they often after a few weeks become used to, to the dose um, and we can slightly increase it again but there's a very very tiny percentage that that still can't tolerate um, much light at all um, another treatment might be more effective like other than transcranial um, applications might be more suitable for those um, few patients so so yes um, as long as you start off titrating it um, as you said um, and explain the reaction no, no problems at all but um, especially when you're running a trial we, we've certainly had to be aware of that. Thanks. I just had a quick comment. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Marty. Oh, I just had a very quick comment about our resting state functional connectivity MRI studies with the football players who possible CTE. And I wanted to endorse what your findings are, that when you work with progressive neurodegenerative disease cases and you stop treatment, that's a problem. And uh, with the football players, they fell off by two months. And we have then disconnectivity, uh, dysfunctional uh, salience network. It's very bad. It goes right back to entry level. But then you start to treat, and it comes right back up. And our first football player did treat for three months. And he restored and got the very best functional connectivity we saw with him in his salience network. And he was just treating default mode network at that point with the neurogamma. So I just wanted to mention these neurodegenerative diseases, I really want to reinforce, they need this long-term treatment. Thank you for talking about that. It's very important. We are at time. Uh, Joe, Joe, do you have a quick, very quick question? Well, I would just put to the panel, uh, you know, these changes were noticed the motor and non-motor almost immediately upon turning the light on. So can we talk about, does anybody have a hypothesis quickly about a mechanism of how uh, almost instantaneous change can happen in a neurodegenerative, long-term neurodegenerative condition? That seems a little bit...
having more plan. energy in the system having more energy in the system makes a difference yeah, we know for, uh, I was involved in something at uh, University of Texas. They did a lot of broadband near infrared spectroscopy work uh, after PBM to the prefrontal cortex. And they did uh, something using our, we did make a whole body treatment system. Uh, and um, they did some tests on that. And uh, almost immediately, I mean, uh, the, the uh, cytochrome C oxidase activity in the brain measured by this amazing gadget uh, goes up with, within a minute it started to increase or to improve and that's uh, followed by uh, a, a suddenly there's like a delay and then suddenly there's this spike in uh, oxyhemoglobin as well uh, as well and an increase in, in deoxyhemoglobin showing basically there's more oxygen consumption so which correlates but with de delayed to cytochrome oxidase it's almost as if cco is is sort of using up the oxygen and then there's a response by the body to quickly send some more uh, uh, a few minutes later um so anyway and that's with 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared to a large area of the body but uh, that's still not a lot in terms of intensity so these are indirect hemodynamic effects with cco uh, changes and oxygen changes uh, shortly after. There's also immediate uh, response in terms of increase in cerebral blood flow. Of course, it depends uh, on uh, um, you know the parameters you're using, um, and also brain pacing with uh, whether gamma or alpha or beta enhancement, uh, which are fairly quick to occur. Um, with that, uh, um, you know, I know we are one minute overboard and I uh, just want to thank again uh, uh, John and Catherine for being here and all of you and to be continued. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank nice you. to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for getting up early. <laughs> <laughs>